Well, let's take God's word again, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. God willing, uh, tomorrow I'm going to leave with Pastor Rob Murphy and go down to Mobile for a couple of days to the Expositors Conference. It will be led by Steve Lawson and Alistair Beck. Uh, You know those two guys, they're preaching uh, machines, a little different. Because Allison preaches with a Scottish accent, which means almost anything he says sounds true, <laughs> whether it is or not. <clears throat> and Steve yells <laughs> at you, so he, get, he keeps your attention. But a little book he wrote called The Kind of Preaching God Blesses. Uh, it's forwarded by uh, John MacArthur, Harvest House Publishers. Just a word or two from this to lay the framework a bit for our Part 2, series within our series of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verses 9 through 11, again this morning. Steve writes in his book on preaching, is this, What so desperately needs to be recovered in this present hour is not merely more preaching, Instead, what is urgently required is more preaching of a certain kind. The problem today is not the scarcity of preaching. No, the issue lies with the utter bankruptcy of so much that passes as preaching today. By any spiritual estimation, something is horribly missing in the contemporary pulpit. The dearth of preaching is nothing short of a modern-day famine for the hearing of the words of the Lord. We live in a time of severe drought for the proclamation of Jesus Christ and Him crucified that is spirit-empowered. There are few clouds in sight and no rain is forecast. Sadly, there is enough dust on the average pulpit Bible to write Ichabod upon it. He goes on to say, The most diabolical ploy of Satan would be for churches to be bulging at their seams but no proclamation of Christ and Him crucified. With this deadly silence, people would never learn of Christ. Thus, they could never know or follow Him. Tragically, too many churches and pulpits have become everything except the main thing. Well, Solomon takes us this morning again into his study, into his preparation and to his teaching of the word of the Lord. Verse 9. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, And like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings, they are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you that you have not left the preacher, the pulpit, or the people without a clear and powerful word that you have made yourself known and you have communicated it in such a way that it could be written down by the hands of men, the pens of men using their personality, their writing style, their context, their humanness to communicate Divinely inspired, infallible, inerrant, sufficient truth in a way that changes lives, open hearts, and washes us in the water of the Word. And so, Lord, we thank you that we don't have to make up a story, try to create or weave together an interesting fable that might leave us smiling and perhaps even pull a tear from our eyes and 
presumptuously leave us thinking that we're okay and everybody's okay. But thank you that you gave us and you have given us a word that confronts us, corrects us, convicts us, challenges us, calls us, commissions us onward, and changes us. So, Lord, would you open our hearts this morning? Would you, my Lord, have your hand upon me? Help me to be faithful to your word. Help us to be diligent hearers of the word. Holy Spirit, come and attend the preaching of the word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What a privilege to be invited into the inner sanctum of wise Solomon, the wisest man, the wisest king, who's given us one of those beautifully written books in all of history, the book of Ecclesiastes. If you could go into any pastor's study on a Sunday morning, you would find most likely uh, sort of the final look the tweaking, if you will, one more study, one more uh, read over, more time of prayer and preparation as he prepares to preach the Word of God. So if you could think of a pastor, think of one now, maybe you'd like to go into his study, not only on Sunday, but any day of the week, what do you think you would find? You'd probably walk in, if you could be invisible, scan the bookshelves and look at the pictures on the wall. You'd notice his desk, messy, with books open, papers scattered, pens everywhere, a computer, a coffee cup with just a little bit of coffee that's cooled down as it prepares for the next filling. You see a man uh, wrestling over the text, looking bewildered at times, smiling at times, weeping at times. You'd see him get up from his desk and and walk around the office and and rub his eyes and run his hands through his hair and look out of the window and and think and ponder and question himself and challenge his thinking and get another cup of coffee and go back to the desk and and study some more. If you went into the, the study of a faithful pastor, you'd see him reading and studying and then you'd see him hit his knees and ask God to forgive him for his failures as a person, his sins as a person, as a pastor, and his lack of diligence and lack of attention to rightly dividing the word of of truth, and his prayers that God would be merciful, and that somehow as he leaves the study to mount the pulpit, that Christ would be seen as great through, though the message is carried in a pot of clay. That's what you'll see, something like that. And so Solomon takes us into a study here, actually probably one of Solomon's friends, an editor here at the end of the book, uh, gives his commendation to Solomon, his commendation for Ecclesiastes. When I'm looking at books to consider uh, for the bookstore, books that I'm going to read, it's very important to me, though I understand not so much so to many people today, but I want to know who commends the book. I want to know who commends the author of the book. So Steve Lawson's little book here means a little bit more to me because it says forwarded by John MacArthur. That tells me something. I know MacArthur's not going to casually put his name on any piece of literature that comes across his desk. So I'm looking for commendation. I'm looking for a recommendation. I want to know something about the person I'm reading, something about the person that I'm hearing. I want to know that they are trustworthy and will be helpful to me. And so Solomon's editor comes alongside of him at the end and says, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with care. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote words of truth. It's interesting with all the power and influence that Solomon had in the land that he is referred to in Ecclesiastes as the preacher. The preacher. That is how he sees himself. That is his high and lofty calling as a preacher of the word. 
of the Lord. J.W. Jewett's book on the pastor and his preaching, he tells a story of a distinguished English judge, Lord Bowen. He was speaking about success at the bar and said this, Cases are won in chambers. Jewett comments, That is to say, so far as the barrister is concerned, his critical arena is not the public court, but his private room. Solomon gives us that glimpse into the private room of the preacher. The pastor is a man who must learn how to be alone. He must learn how to discipline himself for long hours in the study. Yes, he's a public man. He must make his case publicly. But before the case can be made and won publicly, it must first of all be understood and learned privately and preached to himself. The preacher must give attention to himself and the doctrine so that he can save himself and those who hear him. You may wonder why we're taking extra time on this section of the sermon. Here we are at the end, and Solomon wants to fix these truths on our heart and mind. You say, well, this is more appropriate for a pastor's conference. This is more appropriate for those who preach and teach God's Word. Why are we spending extra time on it in our church? This is not for the rank and file regular church member. This is for preachers and scholars and writers and whatnot. No, it's included as words to the congregation, those who have been called together in holy assembly to hear from Solomon. And this is what it's all about, really. As he comes to the end, he wants to nail our feet down in that which is true and right and holy and inerrant and fallible and sovereign, that which comes from one shepherd, so that we will not be carried away by every wind of doctrine, like so many churches and so many pastors are. So he, the pastor must... Get alone with God in private to know God and study His Word. Jewett writes, Preaching that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. It is therefore imperative that the preacher go into his study to do hard work. To do hard work. And so Solomon wants us to see that. And yet so many pastors and churches aren't really focused on the Word of God. They're not focused on preaching and not focused on teaching. You can go to some churches and for what seems like an eternity, there's, there's music and singing and music and singing and music and singing and drama and something else. And finally, you get a 20-minute sermon at the end of that. Where's the priority in a church where the pulpit is relegated to the last thing and a very brief thing at that? And so Solomon gives us here the preeminency of Scripture. And so let's go back on to some of the points we looked at last Lord's Day. I'm going to add a little bit to those, and then we'll conclude a bit differently today. As he calls on us to understand, love, know, preach, teach the Word. The first thing we've noted is this. The preacher must be a man of wisdom. Besides being wise, the editor says about Solomon, the preacher must be a man of wisdom. We will learn more about that in, the, in verse 13, that wisdom comes from fearing God. But the preacher writer, and we made that argument last Lord's Day, that the writers of Scripture were preachers of Scripture. Preaching and writing go hand in hand, biblically and historically. Those who've been faithful to preach the Word have also written, and written regularly, written a lot. Most of it never seen by the eyes of men, but some of it uh, sometimes is. Preachers are writers and proclaimers of the truth. But the preacher must have the ability, he must have the skill to apply knowledge. He must have the skill to help people to take big truths and connect them to regular living. To help them understand how the Trinity and how the holiness of God and the mercy of God and the righteousness of God, the omniscience of God, these great and lofty and glorious truths, the doctrine of justification and sanctification and glorification, how these glorious doctrines impact us and touch us where the rubber meets the road. Why they matter. 
and why they are essential. He must have the skill to help people make connections between lofty truths and practical living. And we've made the argument time and again that Solomon was a very practical man in every aspect of life. Every aspect of life. So the editor comes alongside and says, listen to this guy. Read his book. I commend it. Must reading. (laughs) Must reading. That's the old guys, you know, who've who've commended everything. (laughs) They always say, must reading. Okay, two million books this year, must reading. It rises to the top of the two million list. The the preacher must be a man of wisdom. Listen to what he has to say, the writer says. Secondly, the preacher must teach the people knowledge. Well, where does he get knowledge from? We, We already know about Solomon, that he is a student of the sun. He's a student of the currents. He's a student of streams flowing into oceans. He's a student of gardens and fountains and music and relationships. He's a student of time and the proper usage of time. He's a student of life and death. He understands the the empty philosophies of man and he understands the righteousness and trustworthiness of God. He's a student. He studies things. School is always in session for the preacher And the writer, the writer and the preacher that carries his notebook and considers everything in God's creation. Anne Lamott in her book, Bird by Bird, writes this. One of the gifts of being a writer is that it gives you an excuse to do things, to go places and explore. Another is that writing motivates you to look closely at life, at life as it lurches by and tramps around. Writing taught my father to pay attention. My father in turn taught other people to pay attention and then to write down their thoughts and observations. The preacher was a preacher of knowledge. He observed things. He paid attention. And he's trying to teach us to pay attention, to notice things, to notice how things work, how people think, and to get beyond the surface to why people think as they do. He takes us back as we've studied in Ecclesiastes to the fall of man. God created man uprightly, and man chose for himself many pathways. This is why people do what they do. We need to observe, we need to know, we need to think, and the the preacher must teach people knowledge. He must help people to see how the world works and why people are as they are. He must see things as Scripture says that they are, not as they may appear to be sort of the traditional or common logic of man. You ever, how often are you surprised when, you know, you've just sort of assumed something all of your life and then the, the facts come rolling in and all of your assumptions are swept away? It's just sort of a common logic out there. We call it a common core even, right? A common way of thinking about things is sort of the, the popular logic. And oftentimes it's, not true maybe most of the time it's not true as Christians we want to think beyond that and get deeper we want to know things well the foundation of knowledge is Christ John 17 3 and this is eternal life that they know you you see the goal of any knowledge is to know Christ when we look at the sun and the moon and the stars and the birds and the streams that flow into the oceans we want to see the glory of God in that And knowing that, we go to the Scripture to see the fullness of His glory expressed in the person of Christ Jesus. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The third thing we saw is this. The preacher must weigh, study, arrange the text with care. How does he do that? Well, we've noted he spends hours dealing with the text, prayerfully considering the best way to get the message across to his people. So he needs to know his people well. The process of teaching, Solomon says, is important. To weigh is to listen. You see, the preacher is a listener himself. He's a learner himself. If you ever uh, are reading someone or listening to someone that can't learn anything or won't learn anything, they think they already know everything, you probably need to turn away from those folks. The preacher must constantly be learning and growing and developing 
himself. He's a lifelong student of the word. And so he's got to listen. That's, the word way carries with it that idea to listen carefully. To get under and hear God's word. It's interesting, even Christ in his humanity was growing in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Christ, the sinless one, in his humanity was nevertheless growing. He was discipling others, and he was a disciple of the Father himself. He was constantly listening to the Father's voice, grasping the Father's will, and doing the Father's commands. And so he weighs, he listens, he ponders, he hears, and then he thinks about it. You ever, you, you, you take time to, this requires some time. In our fast-paced culture where everything is instant, and communication is instant. Don't you wish you had some of those emails back? <laughs> I do. <laughs> I mean, I think of some of the emails I've sent over the, in the era of emails. I wish I had some of those back. I wish I had thought a little bit more before hitting the send button. Maybe I, I wrote in, a, in, a, in the heat of passion. And when Kevin and I write a letter to the editor this week, we're going to think about it. We've got to do that, brother. We've got to write. We've got to address that. Kelly's scared and Lori's scared now. <laughs> I mean, we can't leave that just out there. Uh, we've got to be faithful to address that. But we need to ponder it. We need to think about it. We need to be wise and careful as we weigh our words. It means to sift. You know, as you're making bread and you're sifting wheat. It, it means to... to to consider. So he listens, he reads, he ponders, he sifts, he considers what's being said. He doesn't just, you know, first impression. Well, you know, my gut feeling is, we say that sometimes. Well, gut feelings sometimes can be right, but oftentimes they need to sort of swirl around in the gut a little longer, don't they? <laughs> I just go with my gut. Really? That's dangerous. <laughs> Sometimes my gut is hurts. <laughs> it's, it's, it's got indigestion. <laughs> we need to think and consider and sift. To weigh is to wrestle with words. Like a dog gnaws on a bone. Like a lawyer preparing for a case. The lawyer preparing for a case arranges like Dr. Luke did and to Theophilus in his account, his prologue to Luke. He writes to Theophilus an orderly account. And so what the editor is saying here about Solomon is this, that the preacher weighs, studies, and arranges means he, he interprets it right. At the end of the day, he gets it right. He cuts it straight. That's what you want. You want a writer, a preacher who cuts it straight, who gets it right, who plows the road straight. Because as Lawson argues in his book as well, as the pulpit goes, so will go the church. Kevin prayed for the protection of the pulpit this morning. And it's not unusual for preachers to start well, to preach well, and to wander off into la-la land as they get older. Pray for the protection of the pulpit. Solomon got it right. He figured it out, and he deserves a hearing. Fourthly, the preacher must seek to find words of delight. And so he weighs, he ponders, he thinks, he listens, he studies, he gets the interpretation right. And then, what is he doing in his study? You know, his, his hair's all messed up, and the coffee, he drinks the cold coffee again, and throws another piece of paper on the floor. But he's still working. And he's working prayerfully through it all. He's trying to, to get the right words. He's trying to find the best way to communicate to his congregation so that it fixes in their minds, so that it serves its purpose, so it accomplishes its goal. And so he continues by thinking of the right things to, stay, to say so that the truth sticks. Now think of the two word pictures. And I started to send them to Josh this morning so we could flash them up there, the, the goad and the tent peg. Think of the two pictures that he uses. I mean, we, you may not remember anything else about Ecclesiastes, but you'll probably remember those two pictures. He writes with pictures. He paints a, 
an image for us. He gives us an image, an image of a goat, a long seven or eight foot long pole with a sharp point, maybe with nails on the end of it as well. We'll talk more about that in a second. And the, the tent peg that holds the tent down. That's the sort of words that he looked for. And you read Proverbs and you see all of the way that he, he put phrases together, put sentences together. He thought about this. We looked at Song of Solomon last week, the way he put things. I mean, he could have said it just in a black and white utilitarian kind of way, but he thought about how to communicate his truth. He, looked, he worked to find winsome words. Much writing and preaching is missing that. No attempt to be winsome in communication. No attempt to be winsome in preaching truth. There's no virtue in being dry and boring. So I'm trying to do better. Pray for me. <laughs> I know there's no virtue in it. <laughs> so pray that I'll do better. The American writer Tom Wolfe described Ecclesiastes as the highest flower of poetry, eloquence, and truth. The greatest single piece of writing I have known. Solomon gives attention to beauty. Do you? Do you appreciate beauty? When you, when you hear a phrase that's carefully crafted, or you read a phrase that's carefully crafted, do you ever just say, oh, thank you, Lord, that was beautiful? Or you hear a piece of music that just captures your mind and your heart and your affections, and you, do you ever just say, thank you, Lord? That was so beautiful. No, no, beauty can be in the eyes of the beholder. It can be Bach or Jones, <laughs> as the case may be. But you ever just sigh and say, thank you, Lord, for such beauty. In the NIV application commentary, the, the writer puts it like this. He says the reference is probably, at least partly, to the high aesthetic quality of his writing. We see that in the frequent word plays that he uses. And he goes on, the aesthetics are not to be considered simply as dispensable ornamentation, however, but as intrinsic to the communication of what is true. Form and content belong together. His words are at the same time words of pleasure and words of truth. You ever think about the form in music? It's not only the content, but what, what, what vehicle carries the content? And it's true in preaching. It's not just the content, but what vehicle? How, how is the content crafted? And as, as godly Christians, God-centered Christians, we need to better appreciate beauty. And we don't see much being built these days that we would really classify as beautiful. If everything is functional. I mean, I can go out of town for a few days, come back, and there's a new shopping strip up here in Dawsonville, it seems like. I mean, not a lot of attention, thought went into that. I mean, it's got a purpose. It's supposed to be utilitarian. No one's crafting, you know, historic downtowns anymore. I mean, that's, there's days I wish we had that. I wish we could just build a historic downtown here somewhere. On four. Even downtown doesn't have that, really. You've got a couple of historic things. <laughs> but the beauty that went into earlier, that's why... You guys like to drive down to Madison every once in a while, right? And just admire the Civil War architecture of the homes in, in Madison, Georgia. Just kind of gasping, beautiful. But we don't think much about that in our, in our work. You know, we just go earn our living. But how can you bring beauty to your workplace in what you do? Doing it excellently, but also doing it beautifully. Solomon tells us it's not just the raw data that's important. Solomon tells us it's the form and the content. These two belong together so that we can be in awe of God. I mean, shouldn't we always be looking for the best ways to communicate truth? One of, the days, one of these days we may, God willing, build a building for our church and we'll do what we think we can do wisely and within means but we should not begin the process by being opposed to anything beautiful by thinking automatically that's a waste of money that could go to the poor 
Christians are concerned about the poor, but we are also concerned about beauty. And so we want to do the best that we can with what we have, bringing all things into consideration. I know we can meet in a cave, but we no longer meet in caves. That's fine. If that's what God provides, we meet in a cave. <laughs> we'll make it as beautiful as possible, that cave. We'll put flowers in there <laughs> or something. And so the writer looks for the form and the content. And then fifthly, the preacher writer is uprightly writing the words of truth. You cannot celebrate character from teaching. You cannot celebrate character from preaching God's word. Paul's words to Timothy at 1 Timothy 4.16 are essential here. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. So, and many sermons have been written with this sort of title over it, the, the minister's self-watch. That's important. That's part one of what it's required to be a faithful minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the, is the faithful watch over one's self. And that's applicable to all of us, that we must examine. The unexamined life is a disaster. We must examine our lives, examine what we do and why we do it, and dig down deep into the motives of our hearts. And so he says, Give a, keep a close watch on yourself. And on the teaching. That's part two. And on the teaching. Persist in this. For doing so, in doing so, you will save both yourselves and your hearers. You will deliver yourself and your hearers from every wind of doctrine, damnable heresies. I mean, how does a preacher come to the conclusion that Allah and the God of the Bible are the same being in a Baptist church in Gainesville, Georgia? How does a guy come to that sort of conclusion? He's not giving careful attention to himself and to the doctrine, assuming that he's a believer, assuming he's regenerated, but way off course somewhere. He's giving attention to the, the winds of popular culture that tell us how we have to say everything we say in order to be accepted by our culture. And it's, it's getting increasingly difficult to know how to say anything in our culture, isn't it? Without someone being... <laughs> without one person being offended and then that affecting the way the rest of us have to speak in our culture. Give attention to yourself. It's easy. And let all the examples of history of such preachers and such false doctrine be like flashing lights before us all the time. Other men who once appeared to be vibrant and solid and faithful to the scripture departed the faith. Don't be presumptuous if you think that you stand and you will stand and this will never happen to me and you would never deny Christ. Remember Peter. The rest of the disciples, they may deny you, not me. That's when you start, you should start trembling a bit. When you start thinking like that. Give attention. He must uprightly write the words of truth. And then six, the preacher must, be, must believe and be committed to the message as being from one shepherd. That's what he says here. He says the, the preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and nails firmly fixed are the collective sayings given by one shepherd. The phrase one shepherd used two other times in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel, and it is referring to the promised Messiah, the promised Son of God. And so in the Old Testament, we have God as the shepherd of Israel. In the New Testament, we have Jesus as the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And here we could make an argument uh, in our arsenal of arguments for the inspiration of Scripture, that the Scripture comes from one shepherd. That shepherd, and it's often capitalized in many translations because the translators believed it was referring to God himself. This is the word of God, the editor says. Solomon got his message not by drinking five bottles of wine and smoking six packs of cigarettes and moving to New England and sitting on the porch of a New England inn and sort of pondering life. <laughs> Solomon did that. 
But at the end of the day, in his letter of repentance, he's speaking with great clarity and he's giving us the word of God. The preacher must be committed to the message. I passed a church recently that was advertising a sermon series on the Apostles' Creed. That sounded good at first, or maybe it was a Bible study or whatever. And then I you know, remembered the denomination that that particular church is a part of. You know, the one that was throwing the big balls around in the assembly hall, the one that embraced same-sex marriage and ordination of homosexuals to the pulpit. You know, that denomination. And so here we have a people have a form, but deny the power. Oh, that they would teach and believe what they teach about the apostles. Start there. That's okay. Let's get started. It's worse things you can do. They teach. They're going to have a series on something they do not believe. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. And in verse 13, Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us up also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. And he's quoting uh, Psalm 116.10 when he says, We believed and therefore we preached. That's the way to preach. And you know the difference, don't you? When someone believes what they're saying in the depths of their soul and they're deeply convicted by what they're saying, it has little to do with their style. I mean, all preachers have different styles. I mean, some are more, you know, like all over the place and excitable and others are more, you know, quieter, calmer. And we can learn, it's not about that. But you know if a man believes that which he is speaking or you often do. I remember when I was a young preacher, 100 years ago, I, was, uh, I would often preach very boldly. And I would also be very blunt. Uh, so much so that when we first got married, I was already preaching before we got married, but when we first got married, I mean, Lori would be, have that horrified look on her face, some of the things I would say from the pulpit. You guys have a meeker, milder pastor. <laughs> the years have hopefully seasoned me. <laughs> very blunt, very bold. And often folks, would, you know, folks in these congregations would come up to me, and I was preaching all over the place then too, and, and they would say, wow, you really believe what you're preaching. And they would also say things I didn't need to hear, like you're going you're gonna to be somebody one day. <laughs> Well, they were wrong about that, but uh, I did believe what I was preaching. And I tried to preach it with conviction. That's what the preacher does. He believes and he speaks. And so he, he sifts, he listens, he ponders, he meditates, he studies, he works hard to find the right words. He believes the message that he's proclaiming, he's preached it first to himself, and he's in his study repenting sentence after sentence. Oh, God, have mercy on me. And then he comes to the pulpit to proclaim the word of the Lord. And here's one of the dynamics. When he does, sometimes it's going to bring pain. One of the interesting dynamics of the preacher preaching is that when he's preaching, he's comforting, he's encouraging, and he's confronting. He's bringing pain. So he's bringing pain one moment, and he's going to shake the hands of those that he brought pain to in just a few moments later. That's a strange dynamic. To boldly and bluntly and confrontively preach the truth and to know it's lodging into the hearts of people and then to shake their hands on the way out. And praying that we all get it, that this is love. That we love one another and we're preaching the truth out of love, in love. There's a way to preach the truth and not do it in love. You know that, right? I mean, you can say correct things to your wife and to your children. Accurate, you can prove it. You've got the footnotes. You know, you can argue your case. You can defend it in a court of law. It's as true as one plus one equals two. But if you 
if you carry it in a vehicle of red face and clenched teeth and bulging eyes and with a haughty, angry, wicked, ungodly spirit, then you have destroyed your message. You've destroyed it. And I can, uh, I can prove my case. Come home with me one Sunday afternoon and we'll just watch YouTube for a while. And I can show you what that looks like if you've not already experienced it. The angry preacher, the frustrated preacher, mad at the world, preaching the truth, maybe getting the, the nuts and the bolts right, but communicating in an ungodly way. Now what happens when the, the pastor, the writer is faithful in these six ways and the people here with prayerful expectation, we can expect several things to happen. This is where we start building even more on our case last week. The first thing is this. We can expect this to happen. When the, the preacher is faithful in those six ways and people are hearing prayerfully, expectantly, with an, a sense of anticipation. We can expect correction and encouragement to happen. We can expect correction and encouragement to happen. The words of the wise are like goads. The words, in one hand, bring pleasure. He's looking for delightful, winsome words on the other hand, they bring pain. One of the purposes of a goad is to bring pain, right? Not out of meanness, meanness, but out of love, to bring correction when someone is out of sync. It's, it's an ancient cattle prod. Now, if you've ever had any cattle, and you've ever tried to herd cattle and move them from one pasture to the next, sometimes... And you love your cattle, if you've ever had a cattle. I had. I had some of my own, and I loved them, in a way. Except when I had to, you know, do something I didn't want to do. <laughs> but if you try to move cattle, and they don't want to be moved, and they're ornery, <laughs> you know, they, they'll come running when your truck drives up and you're putting feed in the trough. You know, they can hear it 16 miles away. <laughs> you know, they're running through the pasture to get to the trough. And then you're trying to move them from one pasture to the next, and they don't want to be moved. But you love your cattle, right? Especially these days, the price of beef, especially if you're going to sell them. <laughs> You've got them just the right, it's the perfect time. You really love them now. <laughs> you're seeing the dollar signs. <laughs> and so what do you do? Because you love your cattle and you want to get them to greener pastures, what might you do? You might use a cattle prod. And a modern one has a little bolt of electricity in it. But the ancient ones were, had that sharp end on the stick, seven, eight foot stick. And so sometimes here's the old cattle trying to go to the next, you know, head to the next pasture. And he says, I think I'll take a right <laughs> or I'll move to the left. <laughs> and so what does the loving cattle farmer do? <laughs> or something like that after they scream at the cattle. They, try to, they use the cattle prod. They use a stick. They use something or their hand. They're trying to push them back over. So they'll go into, so they'll go into the gate in the little bitty arena where they'll be loaded up on the uh, trailer and sent to the slaughterhouse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's one usage. Another usage, sometimes cattle are lazy, Right? And so maybe they're moving along towards the right pasture, but look, they don't know about your 9 o'clock deadline. And they need to be moving faster. So what do you do with a cattle prod or a stick? You push them, you, you encourage them onward. And Solomon says, this is what the word is for. All we are sheep. Sheep are worse than cattle. Sometimes not malicious. Cattle are malicious, not as malicious as a cat, but they're malicious nevertheless. Cats are the most malicious of all animals. <laughs> but sheep are just dumb. And they just wander off. And fall off of cliffs. Get lost. And so, what do you do? The, the, what's the word do? And all of we, we're like, and that's the comparison the Bible gives us. You're like sheep. <laughs> wandering away. And so the word is to be skillfully used to prod people back to the course. And the gain occurs because of the pain that's involved. It's painful to get back on course 
but we love you. God loves you, and he has a wonderful purpose for your life. And part of that purpose for your life is that you will walk in a holy way. And then walking in a holy way means you've got to be sometimes prodded back to the course. Sometimes it means, <clears throat> and churches are notorious in this too, we can just get content where we are. I just like the church the way it is. I, no joke, I was talking to a guy years ago uh, at a, a church up in the mountains here, and he said to me, he said, you know what I wish we could do? I wish we could lock the doors of the church, keep the people we have here now, and not let anybody else in. He said, I like it just like it is. And he was complaining about all the people moving here and the county changing and how that's affecting the churches. Well, it's really not affecting its church too much. But I thought that mentality, just lock the doors, let's keep, we got something sweet here. You know, there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. Why would we want to mess that up by bringing messy people in? What an unbiblical, ungodly way of thinking. Sometimes the church gets to think, well, I'm pretty comfortable. I like things the way they are. I really don't like to change. All of us feel like that. I'm for, I for one. <laughs> and so the, the prod is to move us on down the road a bit. We're dragging our feet. We're moving slowly. How many times have you read a book or heard a sermon that sort of jolted you forward? That's the word having its, having its work. And so the... the the farmer could move the ox down the road a bit. He could get him back on course. Jesus would use this to describe Paul. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. I mean, Christ was in Paul's pathway, and it was going to be painful, but he was going to get Paul's attention and change his direction. The word hurts. We fall off cliffs. We're always falling off one side of the horse or the other. We move from legalism to license we do all sorts of things but the word equips ephesians 4 12 second timothy the word equips us what's the word equip mean it means to take a broken bone and to snap it back into place that feel good that doesn't feel good but that's what the word does the word equips think about a more primitive health health culture when all they had was whiskey and a, to drink and a nail to chew down on all right, we're going to snap the bone back into place. We're going to cut off the gangrene limb. It hurts. That's what the Word does. It, it takes broken things and it puts them back into place. And the process is very difficult. And we don't like it. We don't like it. Many professing Christians are very content in their way of living. And they don't want to be confronted by a preacher or by a book or by a friend, or by a parent, or by a neighbor, or anyone else. Leave me alone. That's the common, and so you challenge people, and they, they bow up. Hey, brother, I love you, but I, I noticed that you've been A, B, C, or D. I read about a country singer this week. I don't remember his name, but it was in the news. He, uh, he, uh, committed adultery on his wife a number of years ago, ran off with an American Idol winner. His fans disapproved. He chastised his fans. Don't tell me how to live. Don't tell me what I'm doing is wrong. And so he divorced his childhood sweetheart, ran off and married the American, or lived with, whatever he did with the American Idol girl. And he's mad that people are complaining about that. But not too much, obviously. They're complaining because they're still buying his records. <laughs> when the Bible confronts people who are doing things that they love, they get mad at the, the message and the messenger. Sometimes a, a preacher or someone will say, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> well, they're mad at the message and the messenger. We all struggle with that. So the preacher writer must use the word like a goad to confront people, to poke them, to get them back on track, to move the, the church down the tracks a bit when they're dragging their feet, to prod us onward. And so Ecclesiastes is Solomon's goad to get us to think about the fleeting nature of life and all the things that we're attaching our hands to and our hearts to. And he's saying, let go. Let go of trusting in things for your joy. And look above the sun. 
And the other picture he uses is of the nails firmly fixed. In Old Testament times, the common dwelling place of the Hebrew people was a tent. So we know them as a pilgrim people, don't we? As a traveling, sojourning people. It's easy for them, it should have been easy for them to understand this earth is not our home. They're tent dwellers, so they put the poles up, and then they drape the poles with animal skin or some sort of cloth, and then they tie that skin off with ropes, and they attach the rope to these stakes that are in the ground and tie to the stake, and the stakes are to hold the tent in place. That's the purpose of the Word. The Word is to communicate truth and then take that truth, and the Word itself is like a hammer, and the hammer drives the stake down deep into our minds and our hearts into our lives and it keeps us firmly fixed it holds us in place because if a tent is not staked down it will blow in the wind and paul says in ephesians 4 13 that we're you know we need to be in the unity of the faith we need to have the the, we need to know the son of god we need to grow to maturity we need to grow in fullness of christ and so he says as a result we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by Waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth and love were to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. You want to grow? If you're a Christian, you want to grow. And so don't, don't bow up when the word confronts you. Listen. Think about it. Study it. Meditate on it. Distill it down. Study it. And apply it. Don't say, you know, I'm going to lose this. Yes, you are going to lose some things if you let the word get nailed down in your heart, but how are you going to gain the joy of Christ? And so the faithful Solomon preacher, man, writer, man, is a tent man. He's driving stakes down to hold the tent. He's working to ground men and women and boys and girls deep in the truth so that when they encounter craziness like Chrislam, as it's often presented in our culture today, They will know. We want these boys and girls here to go off to college one day, well-rooted and grounded in the truth with discerning minds, so they will know when they encounter error. Their faith is going to be challenged, it's going to be shaken, but what can we do as a church to send them off, to send them on their way with the word firmly attached to their hearts? And it's going to be beyond the sermon. It's more than the sermon. More than the sermon. We've got, to, we've got to get into the hearts and lives of our young people and our older people. So again, again, lots of older people start off solid, and then as they get older, they just lose their minds, spiritually speaking. They go crazy doctrinally. Start saying and doing dumb things. Don't do that. Stay under the word of the Lord. Use the hammer to drive the tooth, truth down. Otherwise, folks are going to be led astray by their feelings, by bad doctrine. And Ecclesiastes is designed to stick like a nail in our minds to anchor us down to the one who will not let us go. Don't be unstable. Get nailed down. And you need to be nailed down in many ways. Right now, you need to nail this down. Not in a a legalistic, dutiful, check off the list kind of way. But this is God's book given to you. Do you know it? Are you growing in your knowledge of it? I mean, are you, do you love the Lord and want to spend time with Him regularly? Read the Word. Read it purposefully, thoughtfully. Read it as Solomon describes here. Nail that down today. By God's grace, Lord, I need your help. By God's grace, Lord, I want to know your Word. You need to be leading your family in family worship. Regularly. I'm not going to give you the amount of time you need to do that, how many days you need to do it, but just regularly, you need to be gathering with your family to read Scripture, to pray, to, to uncover the treasury, what's in the treasury of Christ, exposing your family to the character of God as revealed in Scripture in the same way that Solomon does. Dad, you're the pastor of your family. You're not the, you, you don't, you're not the pastor of the, the church, but you have, you're the little pastor of the, of the little church, in a sense, your home. Instruct your family. Moms, you have responsibility in that too. Grandmothers, grandfathers, family worship. You need to be a member of an imperfect evangelical church and show up most every week of the year. Nail that down. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. 
You need to work doubly hard not to just hear the word, but be a doer of the word. Because these are the words, he says in verse 11, that come from one shepherd. The inspiration, authority, and heresy, sufficiency of scripture. And maybe next time we'll look at the pastoral epistles to see how that's nailed down even more. I've got uh, numerous examples of, of that. Solomon and Paul had a lot in common in this regard, as he told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 14, continue what you've learned and firmly believed. You've been acquainted with the sacred writings from childhood and able, able to make you wise for salvation. All scripture breathed out by God, profitable, teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. Preach the word, he says. Or Ezra 7, 9 and 10, the good hand of God was on him, for Ezra set his heart to study the law of God, to do it, to teach his statutes and rules to Israel. And then the warning in verse 12 of my son beware of anything beyond these of making many books there is no end and much study is wearisome wearying to the flesh. But what's he saying? Solomon here's collected wise proverbs indicating the wisdom of God in proverbial statements if you will. Short, salient Stick in your mind, fix in your heart kind of thoughts. There's a lot of other wisdom out there, that's what he's saying. There's a lot of other collections out there that are opposed to the wisdom of God that offer another pathway to happiness or righteousness or whatever it may be. He said there are always going to be plenty of books like that that lead you away from the truth. Two million a year now, right, being published in the world, something like that. And there's always the temptation to, to be novel. And one of the challenges for, for the scholar is to come up with something novel, something uh, provocative, something no one's ever thought about before. And, and he's, he feels tempted and challenged and provoked to do that outside of the orthodox way of thinking about Scripture. So you have new theology books coming down the pike all the time. Some of them good, some of them not so good. Various ways of thinking about the Bible that are undermining up to the faith. And we need to be careful of that. He's not saying don't read any other books. He's not even saying don't read non-Christian books. I mean, I, if you're interested, I, I've written a good bit on the, uh, the Christian, how a Christian can benefit from reading non-Christian literature. Paul used non-Christian literature to communicate in Acts 17, 28, for example. But a lot of culturally hip Christians do seem to be enamored by a lot of the wisdom of the age. And much that is packaged in Christian garb is worse. I mean, I would rather have something that's just start raking, uh, raving mad, but makes no claims to Christ than the sentimental, syrupy, fluffy, worthless sugar food that's offered up to Christians by Christian publishers and Christian bookstores everywhere. I mean, just because it's in the Christian bookstore doesn't mean you need to buy it. <laughs> Especially if it's on the counter. Do like I do. Go in there and while the, the guy's not looking, you substitute what's on the counter. You got, go get a, go at the very back on the bottom shelf in the right corner, get a doctrinally sound book, pull it out, take it to the front. The guy's bending over, swap the books out. That's what you do. <laughs> it always works every time. And thousands of people get saved as a result of, of that, <laughs> that effort. You'll weary yourself in the wisdom of man with the next new thing off the, the press. Read. Read widely. Read well. He's not diminishing that. We can make that argument and we maybe will another time. But. Michael Eaton says, The making of many books began long before any conceivable date for Ecclesiastes. Writing was well established as a hallmark of civilization from about 3500 B.C. onward. Books, quote, were written first on clay tablets, later on papyrus or leather. When an alphabetic script came into Syria, Israel in the second millennium B.C., it brought the possibility of, quote, no end of books. Evidently, there was too much in this body of literature. And that's what he's talking about, that the wise... Man thought fit to warn against, since it did not come from one shepherd. 
All right, let me close with a, a couple of thoughts. Again, just drawing a little bit from the new uh, NIV application commentary. Having the scripture is no use to you if you don't know how to read the scripture or you misappropriate the scripture. You see, that's the, the devil used the scripture, okay? There are a lot of people out there giving us the biblical way to everything under the sun. They're using the scripture to sell their goods. They're using the scripture to gather a crowd. They're using a scripture to promote their next book or event. But they're not using it rightly. So if you don't use the, read, learn how to read the scripture and use the scripture appropriately and see it as that which is designed to correct you, to prod you onward and to show you the gospel of Christ... Look for Christ. Listen to the sermons that Todd preached a couple of weeks ago. Get on the internet. Listen to those. The centrality of Christ in the Old and the New Testament. So just having the Scripture, even reading the Scripture, you need to learn how to be skilled in the Scripture. And then, knowledge of how to read the Bible is not something that we innately, innately possess. Acts 8, 26-40 tells us of an Ethiopian official on a journey from Gaza reading for the book of Isaiah Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I understand? Unless someone explains it to me. So Philip helped him to understand what he was reading. I mean, these things are spiritually discerned. I'm coming to Christ and having the Spirit in your heart will really change the way you read the Scripture. There are a lot of scholars out there who know a lot about the Bible, but don't know Christ, and so they miss the heart of Scripture because these things are spiritually discerned, and even among those who have spiritual discernment, we need help. And so God has granted to us help in that. Jesus told his disciples in Luke 24, 25, O foolish one, slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it, was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them in the scriptures the things concerning himself. So don't, Misread Scripture, but more importantly, don't misappropriate Scripture. Be a humble student of the Word. What words that he's, the Lord's given us here? Weigh the Word. Study the Word. Arrange the Word. Interpret the Word faithfully. Look for words of delight and uprightly. And thank God for that. Let the Word be like a cattle prod to you, to get you back on course and to send you down the road let it be like nails firmly fixed remember that this is the word given by one shepherd and remember who the shepherd is he's the one who laid his life down for his sheep so when you go to the scriptures make a beeline as Spurgeon said for the cross the scriptures tell us about Christ his life his death his resurrection and how his word washes us and cleanses us and changes us and helps us what a grounding truth we need to hear at the end of Ecclesiastes when everything is fleeting. There's one thing that's not. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God lasts forever. Lord, thank you for your word and your people and the opportunity to preach it this morning to uh, folks who want to hear it. Lord, help us to get under it as we would a cleansing waterfall and let the water uh, cleanse us Help us, Lord, to feel the prodding of the Scripture and get back on course or to move us down the road, to change our thinking about something we've always assumed that's not right. But mostly, Lord, use your word to help us to see Jesus in his glory. We pray in his name. Amen.